Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Just a, a quick housekeeping note. Uh, if you wouldn't mind muting your microphone, we'll avoid any uh, feedback or uh, duplicate sounds or anything like that. Uh, and while we've got our special guest with us today. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, turn things over to Giancarlo. Uh, Giancarlo Lyle Adrosolo is Chief Nursing Officer of Providence St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica, California. He's a longtime AONL member and has served on the AONL Board of Directors and is currently a member of the Foundation's Fund Development Committee, whose members planned this event today. Giancarlo, all yours. Thank you so much, Danny, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to help host this event. So, you know, Florence Nightingale, or many of us know her as the Lady with the Lamp, uh, well known for her work during the Crimean War, um, also known as the founder of modern nursing. Um, it is, has been really instrumental, not only within our profession, but also in healthcare. I think one of the things that I love about uh, Florence is that she believes that nursing is both a science and an art. Ms. Nightingale once said that, I am of certain convinced that the greatest heroes are those who do their duty in the daily grind of domestic affairs, while the world whirls as a, as a maddening dreidel. That's a tongue twister. But I think many of us um, draw from Florence's teachings and writings from over, 200, uh, over 150 years ago especially uh, this past two years and in challenging times within our professional careers. My, per my personal Florence um, favorite, person my personal favorite of Florence's quotes is, is that how very little can be done in the spirit of fear. And that's helped drive me as a leader throughout, um, throughout my career as well. So welcome to our program today um, entitled Lighting the Way, a Florence Nightingale Story. The AONL Foundation hosts this event as a small token of gratitude to you, our nurse leaders, our nurses and healthcare workers, those who do their duty in the daily grind. As you may know, the AONL Foundation funds research for nursing leadership. It provides financial aid for nurse leaders continuing on their education. The foundation also hosts the nurse researcher plenary session during the AONL annual conference. The foundation brings together practice and industry in the new Think Tank, Think Tank program and awards the Animal Nurse Researcher of the Year Award. A few of the currently funded research studies um, made possible by the AONL Foundation um, include understanding chief nursing officer turnover, building human connection during the merger of two global pandemics, Another one includes nurses' experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic, examining nursing leader impact and staff redeployment, and most recently, the COVID-19 impact studies. We are very grateful for the generous support of our donors, and specifically, we could have not have provided this program today without the generous support of our sponsors, Avisher and Hillrom. I believe both Lisbeth Votruba from Avisher and Carlos Areya from Hillrom are joining us today. And we really wanna thank you for your continued support, not only of AONL Foundation, but of AONL. At this time, I would like to introduce to you no other than Ms. Florence Nightingale from the Florence Nightingale Museum in London. Ms. Nightingale will be sharing her story with us for the next 30 minutes or so. You will then have an opportunity to ask her questions via the chat function. And I have the honor and privilege to be able to read those questions in the chat and allow, allow Ms. Nightingale to be able to answer them. So without further delay, please welcome Ms. Florence Nightingale. Well, hello. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can see and hear me well. I would say good morning, yes, but it is evening over here. So do forgive me if I'm not quite as bright and chirpy as the rest of you. I'm sure you all are. Well, hello. Yes, I am Florence Nightingale, and I have just come here to explain a little about my life and tell you my story. Now, I'm just going to share my screen, which will hopefully enable you all to see what I can see. Fantastic. So, I think the best place to start in my story is the very, 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 
beginning. Now, I was born 201 years ago in 1820, on the 12th of May, 1820. And British as I am, I was not born in England. No, I was born in Florence, Italy. Now, yes, I think you might have spotted it. My parents were not very original when it came to naming me. <laughs> and they looked around them and simply thought, hmm, where are we? Ah, oh, I know, we shall call our daughter Florence. We are in Florence. Now, my parents were actually in Italy on their honeymoon. It's a rather long honeymoon to be able to have two children on their honeymoon. Yes, my older sister, Parthenope, was born in what we now call Naples, but then it went by a different name, Parthenopolis. Parthenope, Parthenopolis. Yes, you can see again, my parents were not very imaginative at all when it became to naming their children. So yes, Parthenope was two years older than I was, and we were both born in Italy. Now, when I was two, we traveled home as a family back to England. Now, in England, oops, there we go. Oh, there we go. I forgot to show you this slide. There you go. So here's my sister, Parthenope and I. Parthenope is here sitting upon my mother's lap and I am to the side of my mother there. And yes, you can see the two stars. So I was born in Florence, which is where the star is on the yellow section. And then the other star is to show you where Naples is, Parthenopolis, where Parthenope was born. Now, yes, we moved back home to England. And yes, we had two rather large family homes. You see, we spent our family summers, which where we are, it was sort of from May to about September time in Embley Park, which is in Hampshire. Rather large house you see here on the right. And then we spent our winters at Leehurst in Derbyshire. We had an amazing childhood. And yes, we spent many a time out in the gardens. Now I have some very sad news to tell you because yes, we were not allowed to go to school. No, in Victorian England, Girls were simply not allowed to go to school. And well, my father wasn't having any of this. No, he thought, well, my daughters will have an education. So he decided to teach my sister, Parthenope and I, at home. And we had many lessons. Yes, we had lessons not by my father, but also by my governess as well. Lessons such as English and history and sciences, of course, and languages as well, and French and German and Italian, and even Hebrew. But my most favorite subject of all was mathematics. Yes, I absolutely loved maths. In fact, I loved my studies and I was always found found reading. Yes, I adored reading. I would often sneak up to my bedroom with my books and read underneath my cover when I was meant to be sleeping. Yes, I loved learning. Now, my sister and I, we were very different children. We used to tease each other awfully. I used to call her Pop, and she used to come back at me with Bookworm, because I always had my head in a book. And we were very different in our studies. So I, I enjoyed learning. I enjoyed mathematics and science, but she, she enjoyed the more creative things. She loved singing and playing the piano and sewing. I detested sewing, I will tell you for that. Hmm, absolutely couldn't stand it. What a waste of time. So yes, we were very, very different children. Now you can see here, a lovely portrait of my sister and I. Now this portrait was created when we girls became of age. Yes, my family thought, well, the Nightingale sisters, it's about time to marry them off. So this painting was created to show all our eligible suitors what the Nightingale sisters looked like. 
You might say it's like a modern day Tinder. Hmm. Now, looking at this portrait and going by the knowledge that I've just given you, you would be forgiven for thinking that yes, the girl sitting down in the pink dress would be my sister, Parthenope, sewing, and I would be standing up holding the book. But no, you would be wrong. No, in fact, it is the other way round. I am the one sewing, and Parthenope is the one standing with the book. Goodness me. I was incredibly bored sitting for that portrait. Sitting there, pretending I was sewing for that long. Dear me, goodness me, I had much better things to do. Now, it was around my six, well, I was 16th, but it was around my 17th birthday that I had a calling. I had a calling from God. Yes, I do remember it well. I was in Embley Park and I was sat under, under a tree. Yes, on a bench underneath a tree and God spoke to me and he told me what to do with me, my life. He told me I had a calling to serve others. And I thought, yes, I should be a nurse. Of course, this is my calling in life. I want to become a nurse. Now, of course, it wasn't that quite straightforward. No, I first had to tell my parents and my sister. And yes, I know. Calling to be a nurse, you'd think, oh, they'd react splendidly. But no, not in Victorian England. They were absolutely horrified. Goodness me, their daughter going off working and being a nurse? No, they wanted me to go and get married. Now, I will say this, though. In my day, hospitals were not very nice places. No, 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 nothing like you see today. And the nurses who worked there were nothing like the nurses today. They were more fetchers and carriers. And in fact, they didn't really do much at all. And they were quite prone to drinking alcohol. Hmm, yes, I can see some of your shocked faces. I know, imagine drinking alcohol while they were working. Goodness me. So yes, you can see why my family did not want me to become a nurse. Now my parents thought, right, let's distract Florence. Let's send her off travelling. So off I went. I went with some family friends, the Bracebridges, and we went travelling around Europe. Now we went to many places. What do I recall? We went to Switzerland. We went to France. We went back to Italy, of course. We went to Egypt and we went to Athens. Now in Athens, I met a rather special someone. No, no, it's not what you're thinking. Let's see, oh, oh, there she is, Athena the Owl. This is my little pet owl, Athena. Now it was while I was in Athens that I saw some boys being rather mean to her. They were kicking her around like a football. I thought, goodness me. So I scooped her up and she stayed with me. Now Athena would travel on my shoulder or sometimes in my pocket and we went everywhere together. Now I know a few of you might have noticed it. Athens, Athena, Athena, Athens. Yes, you can see I'm just as lazy as my parents when it comes to naming my pets, aren't I? Goodness gracious. But yes, Athena was lovely but she could be quite naughty. Mm. Once I caught her drinking ink out of my inkwell. Not very pleasant indeed. And I'm afraid to tell you, she did something far worse. Mm. Once she ate one of my other pets. Goodness me, now don't worry. It wasn't anything big. I don't want to startle you all. It was my lovely little insect, my cicada, Plato. 
Yes, oh, he was a darling little thing. Yes, he would skip around my hand. And Athena saw him one day, swooped down and ate him. I was very, very upset with her, dear me. I said, Athena, go and sit in your cage. Hmm. But Athena was lovely. But Athena, sadly, doesn't have a very happy end to her story. You see, I left Athena with my sister, Parthenope, to look after when I later went to the Crimean War. More on that later. Uh, but yes, as I was leaving, I got a letter from my sister to sadly tell me that Athena had passed away. Yes, she'd flown up into the attic, our loft, and she'd got stuck. Dear me, from then on, I never trusted my sister with another living soul. Hmm, goodness me, poor Athena. But if you ever get the chance to visit London, to go to the Florence Nightingale Museum, you can see Athena. Because, of course, Victorian England, we practiced taxidermy and we had all our pets stuffed, as was custom at the time. And she was perched, just like she is in the picture here, on this piece of bark, and she is exactly the same way in the Florence Nightingale Museum. So do go and visit her if you ever have the chance. Now, enough about Athena, back to my travels. So yes, I was, I was in Greece, and yes, I told you I went to Italy. Now, it was in Italy that I met the Herberts, Sydney and Elizabeth Herbert. I became great friends with both of them, and we would spend night after night talking about nursing, how it could be improved and how hospitals should be improved. Now they will come back into the story later, but it's time for me to return home to England. Yes, it's been several years now. I've been traveling, I've been at home. I am now 31 and I haven't got rid of this silly idea of nursing. I go back to my parents one last time. Parents, I am not going to drop this. I want to serve others. I want to serve God. I want to become a nurse. And I have some good news for you. They finally gave in. Yes, well, I think they thought, well, well, 31, much too old to get married now. Okay, Florence, goodness to me, you've gone on about it. Go, go and train to become a nurse. She won't like it anyway. Hmm, little did they know. So off I went. I went to Kaiserwerth in Germany. These slides are very slow today, do forgive me. There we go. So Kaiserwerth, here we go. Yes, I was, I was at Kaiserwerth for three months. Now, discard any thoughts of nursing training you have at the moment because this is not the same. No, I was taught how to scrub floors and make beds. I didn't go anywhere near a patient. No, no, no. Uh, but I was taught about bedside mannerisms, I guess. And I was taught how to instruct people. I was taught how to make sure the beds were made neatly. But I spent three months training under my matron. I learned especially to follow orders. Hmm, that one you will be familiar with. Now, we tra I travelled back home to England and I got a job. I got a job in London. Oh, I was very excited. Yes, I was made superintendent. Oh, goodness me, that meant I was in charge of organising, of scheduling. I was in my element and of course I was finally a nurse. Now unfortunately it was unpaid so my father did have to give me an, an allowance but no matter I was finally doing what God put me on this earth to do. Oh I was as happy as the day is long. I was a nurse. Now around this time a war broke out. 1853, a war broke out, the Crimean War. Now it was between Russia and Turkey originally, over territory, the Crimea. Mm, nothing's changed, has it? Well, in 1854, 
more countries joined. So we have France and Britain joining Turkey to help fight the Russians. Now we had 30,000 men travel from Great Britain all the way over to the Crimea. And I have good news, yes, they won their first battle, the Battle of Elba. Well, excellent news, but it wasn't good news for the poor injured soldiers, because you see, there wasn't very good grounds, medical care at all. No, in fact, there wasn't even a hospital over there. They, they were treating men on the battlefield. Now, there was a reporter, William Russell Howard, who reported for the Times newspaper. He wrote down what he saw, and of course, there was outrage in Britain. This travelled round everywhere and started a campaign. Eventually, enough money was made so that they could have a hospital in Turkey. Scutari Hospital, a very, very large hospital. In fact, it was one of the largest of its time. Now, it was still nowhere near the Crimea. It was still a boat journey. Don't get me wrong, but it was a hospital. But not a very nice one. Now, when they got to the hospital, they realised a severe lack of nurses, though. And who was now Secretary for State of War but my friend, Sidney Herbert? And Sidney wrote to me. He wrote to me saying, Florence, we need your help. Can you help? I need to gather a party of nurses to send all the way over to the Scutari Hospital. Now, I don't think he really imagined that I would step forwards myself. I think he was more imagining that I would put together a, a party of nurses. But as soon as I got his letter, I knew where I needed to go. I began to interview ladies. Dear me. I interviewed over 200 ladies. Most of them were unsuitable. Dear me. No, in the end, I ended up traveling with a rather large number of nuns because I knew that they would listen and take instruction. Hmm, the most important thing, of course. So 38 nurses and I traveled over to Scutari Hospital. Oh, it was a treacherous journey. We traveled by carriage, by boat, by carriage, by boat, and I got terribly seasick. I was not very well at all. But finally, we reached Scutari Hospital. We opened the door and, goodness me, the smell and sight that was before us was an absolute disgrace. Well, there were, there were soldiers, the men, who were just lying all over the floor. There were rats, there were cockroaches, there was blood and sick on the floor. There were bandages that the doctors were picking up off the floor, using on the men, taking off of the men and putting back on the floor. Now do forgive me one moment because I do have to talk about something quite delicate. The toilets. I know I can see some of your faces. I'm very sorry indeed. Uh, but yes, the toilets were blocked. Mm, there were only a hole in the floor, but yes, this hole had become blocked. Everything was building up along the pipes and out onto the floor. The soldiers, the wounded, were laying in sewage. I had a moment to go and observe the well. So I peered down the well. A dead horse was in the well, in the water that these men were drinking from. Goodness gracious. This hospital was absolutely disgusting. There were more men, soldiers, dying from curable, treatable diseases than from their wounds on the battlefield. This hospital was not working at all. 
I knew what I had to do, and I started to get to work. Now, of course, it wasn't that easy. There was a particular doctor called Dr John Hall who didn't like this group of ladies coming in and telling him what to do. He said, no, no, just go, get out of my way, go and sit in the corner. Well, you can see I didn't take very calmly to that. And in fact, I wrote home, Sydney, and to Lord Palmerstone, Prime Minister Palmerstone. I ended up with a letter directly from the Prime Minister, which I showed to John Hall, which said, let Florence go about her business. Hmm. I was in charge and I got to work. I cleared out everything. I took away all the broken beds, the debris, the rats, the horse carcass from the well. 64 dead animals and birds I found in that hospital, out. We swept, we, we mopped, we scrubbed that floor. We got in new beds. We got in cupboards so we could neatly store the medicine. We could fold up and wash the bandages. We could wash all of the sheets, the uniforms. Some of the men were still in their uniforms that they'd been wearing for months on end. Goodness me. We got pillows. Now, money was in short supply, so we ended up stuffing straw into a few sacks and making some pillows. That's when my sewing skills came into use. We unblocked the toilets and we got that horse out of the well. We lime washed and scrubbed the walls. Finally, this place was looking much, much better. And I turned things around. Now less men were dying from disease. I began to use my mathematics to plot down exactly what had happened. I'm so sorry, I got so carried away with my story that I completely forgot to show you my next slide. Me and technology, I don't know. So here we have a picture of my journey to the Crimean War. So you can see I began in London, I crossed over into France and then I had a huge boat journey over to Turkey. Scutari Hospital, of course, was full of rats. And here we go. This is the moment. This is what it was transformed into. We have nice, clean floors. We also put a stove and oven right in the very, very middle of the hospital for warmth. I got a chef, Alexis Sawyer, to come into the hospital. He was from France. And he came up with this stove. He invented it himself. And finally, we were able to bake casseroles with vegetables in. Before, they were eating just mouldy bread and raw meat. So we had worked very, very, very hard. Now, of course, I gained a nickname while I was out there. The Lady with the Lamp. Now, I'll tell you how this nickname came about. You see, I used to walk up and down the rows of beds late at night, four miles worth of walk in between the beds when all the other nurses had gone to bed. I would walk that night with my lamp to make sure that everyone was okay and that no one ever died alone. That was very important to me. Now men would say that they would reach up out of their bed and kiss my shadow as I walked by. I became known as this lady with the lamp, and this name traveled all the way back home to England. I started to become a celebrity. People would write about me in the papers. They'd build statues of me and, and paint my portrait, but they never painted me with the right lamp. Now, if you look at this picture here, you can see I'm standing next to my lamp. This is a fanous, and it might not be what you'd expect it to be, because I was often painted with either an oil lamp, something that I might have used in England, sometimes a genie lamp. But of course, I was in Turkey. I would be using a Turkish lamp, a fanous. 
Now this fanoose was very good because it meant I could walk around it, around with it, and then collapse it so I could put it down, light a candle and bring it back up again. It was very useful. Now, if you ever see me, and I'm not holding a fanoose though, you can tell everyone you know, well, that is the wrong lamp. Hmm. Now, what did I do next though? Now, I traveled home from the Crimean War. It ended in 1856. First of all, I made sure all of the soldiers have gone home, all of the nurses have gone home, and finally I left for England. Now I'd become a celebrity and I didn't like this. No, I did not like the hush, the fuzz buzz around my name. No, not at all. So I decided to go home under the name of Miss Smith, which was actually my mother's maiden name. And I returned home undetected. No one knew who I was. But then did I sit back and think, well, I've done my nursing. Absolutely not. There was work to be done. I began to write. Now, I did a lot of my writing from my bed. You see, I'd become quite ill. At the Crimean War, I caught Crimean fever and I almost died over at the Crimean War. And although I recovered at the time, I never fully got better. And I would have these huge bouts where I would get awfully ill again. So I did a lot of writing from my bed. But right, I did. I wrote over 200 books and pamphlets, over 14,000 letters, I was a very, very busy lady, and you all might have heard of my most famous book, pictured here, Notes on Nursing, what it is and what it is not. This is still used today and it's still being published. I also, ooh, let me just move this, I also looked at hospitals and how they should be improved. Yes, I thought we should have wings to separate out our contagious and non-contagious patients. I helped design the first St. Thomas's Hospital into pavilion, pavilion styled walls. I also used my mathematics to help. Now some say I also started the very first inkling of pet therapy because over in the Crimean War I bought my soldiers a pet tortoise called Jimmy, something they could look after and make them feel better. And of course, we now bring pets, animals, into our modern day hospitals. But you can see my quote here, a small pet animal is often an excellent companion for the sick. So maybe that's where it all started. Now, I did want to talk to you about my maths. There we go, my statistics. Now, I did tell you I loved mathematics, but I love mathematics. Yes, I came up with this coxcomb diagram. Now, this coxcomb here shows all the deaths that happened at the Crimean War. The red were deaths from battle. The black were unexplained, but the blue, the blue is what I want you to look at. The blue were deaths from curable, treatable diseases in Scutari Hospital. And you can see if we start off on the right, this is just before I arrived and we go over to the left and I've reduced that a lot. So yes, I use my mathematics to prove that cleanliness helped the soldiers get better. Now, I also start, started up my Nightingale Training School. Now, this was in 1860 in St. Thomas's Hospital. I wanted to train nurses properly. They knew exactly what they were doing. And of course, I was very strict and had a very strict guidelines. And we still have some Nightingale nurses today. Now, although I died at the age of 90, I lived a very, very, very long time even in Victorian England, 90 was very, very old, and I died in 1910. But my legacy still continues today. 
my legacy. We still have nurses learn, learning under my instruction. We still have school children learning all about me and maybe thinking, oh, maybe I could become a nurse. So although I lived a very long time ago, my legacy continues and I hope you will continue to spread my word as well. Thank you for listening to me prattle on for a very long time, everyone. And I now believe I'm going to open you up so you can ask me some questions. Thank you so much, Miss Nightingale. If anyone has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I, I, there are a few questions in the chat box that I have received. Uh, so I maybe would start um, the questions here briefly. Um, so Ms. Nightingale, uh, you've made so many changes in Skatari. What are you most proud of? I think it has to be bringing nursing to the public eye. I think before nursing was, was such a taboo thing to do. No middle class, upper class lady would ever go near nursing. No, no, no. It was, it was thought of as a lower class job and it wasn't really nursing. So I revolutionized nursing and the idea of nursing. I made people proud to become a nurse and to follow in my footsteps. So I'd have to say that, I think. Thank you. I, I would say that I'm one of those individuals. I am very proud to be a nurse. So thank you for your legacy. Fantastic. Uh, another question thank that. You. Thank you. Another question that came through our chat um, is regarding your time spent uh, several years uh, homebound, and you talked about that towards the end of your um, of your talk. Um, so, in terms of your time being uh, spent at home, does it remind you? Um, of how many of us have to do that in the past two years, uh, and and how do how could that relate to your time in, um, when you were homebound and to now to what we're experiencing because of the pandemic? Mm, absolutely, absolutely. I think it did. I I did feel very very trapped when I was at home, especially when I. I felt very, very ill and I couldn't move. My body ached all over, and I couldn't even get out of bed. But I think it's all in the mindset. And I kept working. I kept working until I was 90. I kept writing. I kept thinking about what could be changed, what improvements could be made. And I do think it's very relatable now when everyone does sometimes feel trapped, like they can't go anywhere, they're being told to stay at home, to continue you, there's so much to be done with life. There's so many improvements you can be made. Write a letter, reach out and reach people. I had so many correspondents, so many friends that I used to my advantage, especially MPs as well, to set through new laws. <laughs> you might have not fr no friends like that in higher places, but reach out to those people you know, reach out to people you think maybe might be having a hard time. I really do believe that people work better connected. And I know sometimes it's difficult, but if I did it in, in, in 1800 Victorian times, the writing letters that people wouldn't receive for days and days, we can most certainly do it in these modern times. Thank you. Thank you for those sage advice. I, I think uh, one of our, um, one of our members also are, is asking for some advice yeah. on what what would what words of wisdom would you give nurses today um, who are currently experiencing burnout and a little bit discouraged uh, about continuing on with the profession? I I think firstly, I would go back to why you decided to go into this profession because it is certainly not for everyone. But there was a moment that I'm sure everyone has here that you decided this is what I want to do with my life. And just remember what that reasoning was. I'm sure everyone's is completely different, but you, everyone must have had a moment. Just go back to that moment and really try and remember that feeling and get back into that moment. And I also think as many hard days as you have being a nurse, as how trying and difficult it is. Think of those days 
when you get those butterflies in your stomach, you have that ray of hope that something amazing has happened. To you. you have done something tiny to change someone's life. And I would also advise writing it down, write these journals down, write these days down, write these glimmer of hope days, that those moments that remind you why you're on those, write those down. So when you're having a hard day, you're having a burnout day, which everyone has, go back to that journal and look through and it will remind you of why, of why you are doing what you're doing. I think you're all fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Miss Nightingale. I think we may have some time for two, at least two more questions. Um, there, there's one that came up um, in the chat, but also actually I'm personally curious about this as well. You, you have done a phenomenal job of leading with, uh, through influence, especially in the last years of your life, um, being homebound after uh, coming back from the Crimean War. What advice would you uh, give us nurse leaders who do, who do have to influence sometimes uh, our nurses from afar, either remotely um, because of social distancing or because of our roles? How could we better influence those that we lead even though we may not be uh, sitting with them side by side? I think there's so many ways to do, to influence people these days. There are so many different forms of social media, books of, even think events like this. I think get together with people if you see an article that you think, oh, actually, I think someone else would like that, send it. Create groups of people. Maybe create just a group on WhatsApp or whatever form of social media you use to put in inspiring articles, inspiring quotes, inspiring websites that you might find, inspiring people, inspiring Instagram pages, to have all of that positive energy somewhere where people can go to and remind themselves. I think I've strayed a bit from the question there. <laughs> but I think use everything at your disposal, use everything. In my day, I only had a pen and paper and word of mouth, but think of there's so many ways to get your message out there. And it's such a gift that we can communicate all four corners of the world. I know it can become overwhelming at times, but think of it as, uh, we're so privileged to be able to communicate across seas in different time zones that we should be using it to our advantage. I hope I answered that. No, no, you did. I think um, we, we have some colleagues that are doing some exceptional work mm -hmm. and best practices in terms of leveraging social media um, and the internet uh, and communicating the value of nursing and the value proposition of nursing to the community. So thank you for that advice. Um, I think we have one question from our CEO, uh, Robin Bagley. Um, you, you are credited, Ms. Nightingale, to be the, for the initiation of the modern day uh, infection prevention program and control science. Uh, any advice for us today, given what we are experiencing with the ever evolving COVID-19 pandemic? wash your hands <laughs> you know i was actually the first one to connect the idea that dirtiness although i didn't know about germs per se at the moment dirtiness led to unhygienic uh, surroundings which led to disease so although the links weren't quite there i was the first one who thought let's clean let's keep our hands clean and our faces clean i remember there's a good quote i gave my nurses to keep hands and faces clean uh, so wash your hands <laughs> i think that's the most basic thing that we can uh, we can tell them and to our to the children as well it's very very simple thing very very simple thing um, that we can pass on to everyone and everyone, no matter who they are, uh, if we can just tell everyone that, just that tiny little bit of advice, then you're one step closer, aren't you? Um, I think I've again strayed from the question here, but... Um, Actually, you didn't. Uh, that's, that's very important advice, something that as a chief nursing officer, and I know many of my colleagues here, and even bedside nurses can relate to, is the importance of washing hands uh, in, sure, in helping prevent patients. 
that. So thank you. Hmm. So I think um, we have time. I heard from our AO now uh, colleagues, um, staff, that we actually have time to be able to open the mic since we have a small enough group. Uh, if anyone in, in attendance would like to ask Ms. Nightingale directly a question, uh, we, we have time for maybe one or two of that. Oh, Beverly, um, we have a question from Beverly. Go for it, Ms. Ms. Hancock. Dr. Hancock, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> it's good to meet you, Miss Nightingale. Hello, Beverly. In your notes on nursing, you mentioned that you should use Wenham Lake ice to preserve the milk. And my husband grew up looking out at Wenham Lake in Wenham, Massachusetts. And I wondered if you know if that is the same Wenham Lake. Oh, goodness, Beverly, I might have to come back to you on that one. <laughs> You've reached the, uh, the far depth <laughs> of my brain, Beverly. <laughs> Queen, I don't Queen, remember that. It's a very good question, and I can definitely answer it for you. Queen after. Victoria um, gave them a citation, and so I believe that that is probably what, what you were referring to. Amazing. I went yeah. to many different places and was inspired by many different things, so it absolutely is, is possible that it's exactly the same. Yes. <laughs> I'm so amazed with your memory. Sometimes I have a hard time trying to remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. <laughs> I, I'm glad that you remembered that. Um, anybody else uh, from, from the team that would maybe want to ask a question to Miss um, Nightingale? Just okay. a brief question. How did you get prepared to do this role and how long have you been um, um, performing or uh, <laughs> as Florence Nightingale? Uh -huh. So you want me to step outside for a moment? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's okay, let's break. <laughs> um, so I have been performing as Florence for um, about seven years now. So I started working in, in London at lots of different museums and I would do Florence quite regularly. And then a few years ago, I became a full-time actress at the Florence Nightingale Museum around the bicentenary. Um, so I do lots of performance to children. I've done quite a few Zoom performances nice, which is, it's very different, um, but it's very nice to be able to reach people that we would never reach before. Um, and I've also, I, I go to schools or I go on outreaches. Um, so I've performed many times as her. And I think as a lot of cases, I wandered into the job and I've just learned and learned and learned and learned. I, I love learning and I've loved finding more things about her. And Beverly, I definitely will go and read that now <laughs> um, because there's always more to learn. Um, so I, I just find her a fascinating woman and it is an absolute honor to, um, to play her and represent her and get to meet you lovely people. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, we, we do wanna thank you, Miss Nightingale for sharing your story with us. Uh, and for affording us time for questions. Thank you for your generosity and your time. Um, you, your pioneering work truly revolutionized our profession and laid the groundwork for many of today's nursing practices. So thank you for that. Uh, on top of that, we also want to make sure that to thank our sponsors one more time. Uh, Elizabeth of Atruba from Avisure is still with us. So thank you, uh, Avisure. Uh, and Carlos already, I think, had to drop off from Hill Rom. Uh, but thank you for your generosity in making this program possible and for your support. I want to mention two ways that you want to get in, that you can get involved with the foundation. Uh, we have a special online holiday auction taking place right now, immediately right now. <laughs> it's going to go on through next Monday, uh, December 20th at 10 p.m. Uh, Central Time. So 10 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, December 20th. Uh, Danny, I believe, will be putting the link into the for the auction in the chat. There we go. I just saw it. Uh, and if you're looking for any last-minute gift ideas, uh, you could. 
uh, bid and win a designer purse, uh, jewelry, gift baskets, or even a guitar. This may, 2022 may be the year that you pick up that guitar and actually learn how to do it. Um, secondly, uh, our, our AONL president, Dr. Mary Ann Fuchs, ha and her husband have, general, have generously offered to match all charitable gifts to the foundation between now and December 31st, up to $10,000. Uh, Dr. Fuchs is giving this gift in honor uh, of the service of our AONL board of directors and staff. And we, we also want to pause and thank our leadership team, Dr. Marianne Fuchs, our, our CEO, Robin Bigley, our staff, and the AONL board for their, for their work, for the exceptional work this past two years throughout the pandemic and supporting our nurse leaders. Uh, Danny should be putting uh, the link in the chat if she already hasn't done so. Uh, but you can click on the link to be able to donate uh, and help support uh, AONL and its mission. Everything that we raised um, through the uh, donations and the auction will go towards supporting the AONL Foundation's mission uh, to provide resources to create opportunities that bridge science and practice to shape the future of nursing leadership. Ms. Nightingale, thank you again for joining us today. And to all our attendees, I hope you enjoyed your time with Ms. Nightingale. On behalf of our sponsors, Avisher and Hillrom, the Foundation Development Committee, uh, Board of Directors and staff for AONL, we wanna thank you for all you do for your organization, more specifically, your communities that you serve and your teams and patients. We sincerely appreciate you. Thank you for joining us and we wish you, you, you and yours uh, all the best this holiday season and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all.